Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at hunger motivation because hunger is a truly biopsychosocial motivator. We see reasons why we eat from a biological perspective, both physiological and neurobiological impact on why we're hungry and why we need to eat, but there's also the social and emotional ties to hunger as well, plus how we psychologically view ourselves and food that are all going to have an influence on why we eat, what we eat, and when we eat. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at this today by first taking a look at some of the biological reasons why we eat, specifically parts of the brain. If you remember from neuroscience, the brain part responsible for hunger is our hypothalamus. So now we're going to go a little bit deeper into the specific areas of the hypothalamus. The lateral hypothalamus is what makes us hungry. It's what makes us feel hungry when it is activated. The mnemonic that I use to remember this is stimulate the lat will make you fat. Because we've seen studies where rats have had their lateral hypothalamus stimulated and they cannot stop eating. They just continue to eat and eat and eat. But you destroy that part of the brain in a rat and they stop eating altogether. So destroy the lat destroys the fat. So the lateral hypothalamus is what makes us hungry. What makes us feel full? That would be the ventromedial hypothalamus. That part of the brain is what signals to the body to stop eating once we've reached a satiated level or we are full. Destroy the ventromedial hypothalamus and a rat will never know when it is done eating. It'll never know when it's full. It'll continue to eat and eat and eat until it becomes a very, very large rat. So the lateral hypothalamus makes us hungry. The ventromedial hypothalamus makes us full. But hunger is not just in our brain. It's also in our body, right? Our stomach is where we actually feel the hunger pangs that often drive us to eat as well. And this is known as stomach distension. And the research that was done by Washburn was he actually swallowed a balloon. And not just any old balloon, but this balloon had sensors on it and he pressed a lever every time he felt a pang of hunger. Not surprising to us today, but we can now see that when our stomach contracts, that is when we are feeling those pangs of hunger. When we are full, when our stomach is at distension, then we know that we are no longer hungry. This is going to work hand in hand with our hypothalamus as they send these messages to our brain to let us know when we're hungry and when we're full. There are also other chemicals involved in the hunger process as well. Glucose, for example, is in our bloodstream and will also send information to the hypothalamus when we are hungry or full. If we don't have enough glucose in our system, we're going to be hungry. When we have enough glucose, we're going to feel full. Hormones, again, are also going to play a role. Insulin, leptin, and ghrelin are three major hunger hormones that are going to signal to the brain when it is either time to start eating or when it's time to stop eating. The amount that we need to eat is also a biological factor known as our basal metabolic rate. How much energy do we expend and how many calories do we need in order to maintain that. Genes and early childhood are going to influence what's known as our body's set point and that's essentially the weight that our body feels comfortable being at and how much energy our body needs to maintain. And that's why a day or two of overeating or undereating won't really change our weight because our body is trying to maintain its set point. It'll either speed up or slow down the metabolism in order to keep our body at that set point. That's why crash diets don't typically work because they are short term and the body is trying to protect itself by maintaining its set point by changing its metabolism levels. So these are all the major biological reasons that we are hungry or that we feel full. As we said before, there's also psychological and social influences 
our choice of food based on our environment, how we are raised, our family structures, the types of foods that we eat based on our cultures are all going to play a role as well. And then of course there are those societal influences that affect an individual's body image and can lead to disordered eating such as anorexia nervosa or bulimia. But we'll go ahead and stop there for today. Next up, we're going to take a look at our need for affiliation, our need to belong, and our need to achieve. So thank you so much for watching, and as always remember, be kind to your mind.